Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. My name is Alex. With me are my co-hosts, Julia and Noel. Say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. And we're here today to discuss the John Carpenter 1978, I believe, made-for-TV film, Someone's Watching Me! Exclamation point. Yes. The DVD actually has a very nice interview with Carpenter, where he goes into the backstory of the movie. This actually started as... Warner Brothers hired him to write this movie back when it was called High Rise, and it was actually based on a true incident Oh wow! of several women who found themselves stalked and harassed by a guy who was using surveillance technology. And in the uh, mid to late 70s, that was actually kind of a big thing, was surveillance technology suddenly became cheap and affordable, and there weren't laws in place yet to regulate it. That's creepy. I want to recommend a film worth tracking down is a film called Sex Through a Window, which it sounds like porn, but it was actually written by Michael Crichton. Oh, very interesting. And it's kind of his examination of how easy access to surveillance technology led to a rise in voyeurism. I could see. Very interesting film. Yeah, it sounds interesting, for sure. So anyways, High Rise, John Carpenter wrote the script for Warner Brothers. They thought it was just a little too light to make into a theatrical film, so they passed it off to the TV department. And uh, because he was already kind of making a name as a director, they asked him if he would be interested in directing. And it was his first time doing a studio film with a union crew. So almost none of the crew are people that he typically works with. He basically just had to go with whoever the studio gave him. He wasn't allowed to edit the film. He couldn't pick the cinematographer. He couldn't do the score himself. However, instead of this being a real burden that he hated, he actually really was excited by it. He loved the fact that he got to meet all these really experienced technicians and learn from them. This film was actually made before Halloween. Huh. Halloween, it literally started shooting two weeks after we wrapped production on this movie. And it was a lot of techniques that he learned here. He experimented with it Halloween, especially the Panaglide camera that was used for point of view shots and stuff like that. Despite the fact that he didn't have all that creative control, he still to this day considers this to be one of his best movies. Very interesting. And uh, just a few names to bring up. From past episodes, we have Charles Cyphers as the cop Gary Hunt who we probably recognize from Assault on Precinct 13, and he's the sheriff in Halloween. Mm -hmm. And this was also the first film that Adrian Barbeau worked on. And, of course, at the time of Halloween, John Carpenter was in a relationship with Deborah Hill, but within the next couple of years, he fell into a relationship with Adrian Barbeau, ended up marrying her for several years, and she pops up in a few more films. Yes, she does, yeah, for sure. At least two that I can think of. Yes, The Fog and... I. Was she an Escape from New York? She was an Escape from New York, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Producer Richard Kobritz would also produce Carpenter's Christine. This is the first time Carpenter worked with casting director Ruben Cannon, who would return to that position down the road for Village of the Damned, Vampires, and Ghosts of Mars. Anything else to add before we get into the movie? No, again, it was the same as the last few movies, except for Halloween. I knew nothing about this going in and was all the better for it. Yeah, and this is one that I've heard about for years. Carpenter fans have loved this movie for years, but it's had very limited access, so there's always been this kind of mystique around it. Mm -hmm. It's literally only in the last few years that it's ever been available on DVD. I would not have even noticed it. It's got a very similar title to a lot of horrors and thrillers that were coming out at the same yeah. time. It was never even released on VHS. Oh, wow. So it literally was this massive obscurity. Despite the fact that Carpenter would always talk about it, he would always mm -hmm. say it was one of his favorites. He holds it up as one of his best, so that's why there's always been this kind of interest among the fan community in it. One thing I just want to add, though, is that the DVD that's currently released has been matted to be letterboxed. Okay. This film was shot full screen and was meant to be seen in full screen, and someone at the DVD company was like, no, it needs to work on widescreen TV, so let's stick some black bars on it. <laughs> to class it up. I don't think it ruins the film. I don't think it does, but it's still worth at least pointing out that that's not entirely how it was meant to be seen. Understood. I didn't notice it, but I don't have that eye. Relocating from the East Coast to San Francisco to take in a news director gig, Lee Michaels settles into her new state-of-the-art high-rise apartment, befriends a spunky woman named Sophie, and starts dating a sweet guy named Paul. 
Unknowingly at first, she's also become the latest target of a serial stalker who spies on her with a telescope from the building across the street. He quickly gains access to her apartment, planting bugs, tapping into the wiring, and taking photos of her while she's asleep, as well as tracking down where she works and sending her gifts under the guise of a travel promotion. As his harassment escalates, Lee starts putting together the pieces of what all traces back to him, and when the police refuse to do anything, as she can't identify her harasser and he hasn't made any direct threats against her yet, she starts fighting back on her own. She thinks she's ID'd the suspect across the way, but when he's chased out of town by the cops, it turns out he was innocent. Breaking into an apartment where she spotted a telescope, she's forced to watch through it as Sophie is attacked and goes missing. Paul helps by bringing Lee to the county clerk's office, where they learn the regional building inspector has all the tools and knowledge needed to gain access to her apartment and create the havoc he has. And when Lee breaks into the inspector's home, she finds all the evidence she needs to pin it on the man. Returning to her apartment, she's attacked by the inspector, who tries to throw her out the window in a staged suicide, only to go flying out himself. Alex, do you recommend this movie? Do I recommend this movie? Yes, absolutely. I thought it was great. I'll go into detail, obviously, later, but out of all the Hitchcockian wannabes, this is the most Hitchcockiest I found. Without being blatant. No, not at all. It's definitely its own thing. I am not disrespecting the movie at all. It is very much its own thing, with the exception of obvious some similarities to Rear Window being uh, telescopes and windows. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it is definitely its own thing. But it has that vibe, and I can get into more detail later on that. But absolutely, great movie. No, Rear Window definitely... Uh, there's even that one scene in Rear Window where it's like, his girlfriend is going to go to the building across the street and actually break into the apartment. For sure. But it's an interesting reversal on that scene here. Where it's the protagonist. Or yeah. the main protagonist, I should say. So, Julia, do you recommend this movie? Yeah, I quite liked it. I did. I mean, it's one of those things that's like, for a number of the movies that we were watching, where I'm like, what's this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, all right. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. And then it's happened numerous times before. I don't know why I continue to be surprised where I just like stop writing notes. My mouth falls open <laughs> and I just watch. Yeah. <laughs> it's always a surprise. I was a little wary at first. So I'm just like, it sort of seemed like the intro to Eyes of Laura Mars. And I'm like, ah, uh, but of course it was completely different. See, we're not doing a John Carpenter podcast because the man makes bad movies. No, it's true. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. <laughs> Anything else you want to add, Julia? Um, I mean, there's lots of things that I want to talk about, but like, I would definitely recommend it. And uh, I really, really liked it. I also recommend this film. I think it's tight. It's deep. It's thoughtful. It's really well crafted. The story is amazing. The characters are amazing. It's Hitchcock without just sitting there and imitating Hitchcock. It really captures an understanding of Hitchcock. As opposed to like Brian De Palma, of, I'm going to use Hitchcock's cameras in his score and edit mm -hmm. it the exact same way. It really is showing his own gifts as a filmmaker and showing how he himself can work in that style of storytelling. And I not only recommend this, but I'm going to be curious to see if by the time we're done with this entire podcast series, that this might be in my top five favorite Carpenter films. It blew me away that much. Wow. Very impressive, yeah. I watched it twice here in the last two weeks, and just even the second time, I was just as riveted as I was the first. So why don't we go ahead and move into discussion? Why don't we talk about Laura Hutton as Lee Michaels? who I know she was a very popular fashion model at the time, did much more modeling than she did actual acting. But I, I thought her performance was very good. Is this her, one of her earlier roles? I believe so. Let me just take a quick peek here. But yep. She had been acting for a few years, but it's usually just as like the love interest or the supporting character who would pop up and look pretty. Wow. Well, then she's a boss because she was intense, she was likable, and she was a commanding lead. I was really impressed with her performance. And even just a great sense of humor that really made me warm to her, too, especially in the early segments. As we're watching all these Carpenter films, I'm starting to notice that Carpenter wit that's coming through a lot of his characters, and I'm really appreciating it, and she was no different. She's probably actually one of the best ones, I would say, both as the uh, protagonist and as, you know, just being funny. I think she's the third Lee we've had so far. Yeah, he likes that name a lot. Because, <laughs> I mean, we, we had Lee in Assault of Precinct 13. We had Sheriff Lee Brackett, who is, of course, Charles Cyphers, who appears in this movie, too. But, yeah, it's a really well-written character, a really well-written female character, especially considering he hadn't even started co-writing with Deborah Hill yet. I had no idea. Like, I guess I should have known there's a lot of strong female characters in his movies, but he writes women really well. And his female characters, they're treated with a lot of respect. Especially considering the 70s. Absolutely. I mean, like, and not only her, but the character Sophie played by Adrienne Barbeau, who's not only a great female character, but a very positive lesbian character. 
very positive, dealt with very well for the 1970s, especially like with more respect than you would see even now, which would just be a lot of jokes. Yeah. Their friendship was amazing and brings to mind Julia's points on Halloween where I'm almost like, I just want a movie about their friendship. <laughs> <laughs> and of course she dies horribly. <laughs> well, yeah, it obviously goes into a violent end for a lot of these characters. But yeah, that's one of the problems. He writes characters a little too well and you're like, oh, no, I hope nothing happens to them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I loved about Sophie was it's kind of like, I'm gay. And then that has nothing to do with her characterization for the rest of the film. It's just she's gay. Otherwise, she's a completely fully developed character. Absolutely. And it's not about her being gay. It's not about issues involving, you know, how does this affect my relationship with my friend? It, they're just friends. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with attractions. It doesn't, there's no like hidden undertones to anything. It's just they're friends. Absolutely. I was a little worried at first when she's just like, you're not my type. And I, I'm like, I guess that was the mindset back in those days where you're like, oh, you're gay, then you must be wanting to hit on me, which is, yeah. <laughs> and that's the other thing was I like the only other time it comes up was she says, you know, you're one of my only woman friends who never seems intimidated intimidated by me and she's like men don't intimidate me why should you exactly again it's not an issue she's gay and that's not a problem it's yep. just she is it's just sophie just sophie doing her thing <laughs> but yeah it's very interesting that this is a film about harassment about stalking about basically a man trying to just impose himself on a woman's life in every facet of it mm -hmm. and yet it never feels overly gratuitous or exploitative probably because it's a tv movie but mm -hmm. It never goes to, and that was one of the problems with the script Prey that I did the review for was it also kind of dealt with, you know, male objectification, feminism and all that stuff, but it went way too far. I see. And this one, it reigns it in enough that it's still, it explores the topic without feeling like it's kind of reveling in exploring the topic. I found it, yeah, like it's a very classy thriller or horror, which is, I guess it's a new genre unto itself, classy thrillers. And yeah, like you're saying, that's what his angle is. That's his whole thing is controlling women. But it's never portrayed in like a um, exploitative or salacious way. He is pathetic from the get go. And although she's not in control because she's being threatened and her life is being manipulated. But she doesn't fully relinquish the control. Exactly. She stands her ground and she does pretty much everything anyone else would do. Like, I love the moment where he leaves the note saying, I'll be down in the garage. So she grabs the letter opener, goes down in the garage, wanting to find this dude and stab the fuck out of him. She's had enough, man. Like, I would be the exact, I don't think, I think she's braver than I would be. But uh, mm -hmm. definitely she's had enough because in movies, the police are useless. Where they're like, oh, a man's been calling you a bunch of times. We can't do anything unless he makes an explicit threat towards you. I'm like, I don't think that's the case. Uh, well, maybe in the 70s laws. Maybe in the 70s, I guess. Yeah. Julia, do you have any thoughts? Many. Go nuts. <laughs> Go ahead. Me and Alex have been batting back and forth here. We relinquish the floor to you. I really did like that this movie was about mainly two women. Mm -hmm. Two women and Steve. Two women and, and Steve. And oh, I'm sorry. What... Paul, Paul. It was Paul. Paul Steve. I did love Steve, though. Steve what we don't, hound dog, what yeah. we don't have in charm, we make up with Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The guy that was like relentlessly hitting on her. Yeah. I wanted to be friends with them. It's the same thing, I guess, where I'm just like, I want to hang out with you. Mm -hmm. You guys are cool chicks. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, watching her pick up that guy in the bar was great. <laughs> that was when I was like really into it. I'm like, this movie's completely flipped. Like he's just some guy she thinks is cute that she picks up in a bar. You don't see that very much these days. It's always the guy picking up the girl. Like, so it's nice to see that way back in 78. Yeah, what I love is that they actually put that contrast in there. If they have the one guy try to pick up on her in the bar, complete with the later. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, then she sees Paul and actually goes up. And she has, you know, the kind of cheesy joking pickup lines that she uses on him. Yeah, absolutely. She's in complete control. And like, even in her job, she just comes in, breezes into work, and just like, this is what I'm doing. Here it is. And yeah, she's an awesome character. There's actually a lot of incidents of that. I mean, like you have the guy who's showing off the apartment, who's named Leone. Gee, I wonder who Leone's named after. <laughs> who, you know, has a few moments where he tries to hit on her and she refuses to relinquish control of the situation. You know, in the bar, she refuses to relinquish control to the guy who's hitting on her. So she actually goes and finds a guy that she wants to hit on. At work, she refuses to relinquish control to Steve, even though Steve is being Steve. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, these... It really is. It's showing guys being dicks. Oh, yeah. It's not shying away from the fact that a lot of the problems are, it's not even how the women react to the situation. It's that the men are putting them in that situation to begin with. Yep. Guys are dicks. Except it's Paul. 
Except for Paul. <laughs> but yeah, even the cops are like, well, we can't do anything about a guy calling. Can they really, though? I don't know. I think we should go back and learn some law. <laughs> nowadays, you could probably file for, like, restraining orders or harassment charges. Well, now you have to know who it was. Well, nowadays, you get a cell phone. It would be, like, John Murderer yeah. <laughs> at 123 Kill Street, and you'd get him. Back then, tracking where a phone call came from was a lot of work. You yeah, to... he even said, he's like, we can tap your phone, maybe, but the amount of manpower it would take for us to find yeah. out where this yeah. call's coming from, we I don't have enough evidence to back that up. But then again, in like when a stranger calls, they just had to have the operator on the line. So when he finally does call, that's when the guy's like, hey, he's calling from inside your house. Even in Black Christmas, where they're tracking that the phones are coming from upstairs, half the film is about them going through all the procedures of how do you do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, whereas nowadays, now that everything is, you know, on, on a digital network, it's not that hard for the police to be able to poke, poke, poke. Oh, that's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, I mean, they could like triangulate the satellites and I don't know anything. So I'm just going <laughs> to throw words. GPS well, cell phones. No. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They, get, they have a map of the world and then they'll have a small red blinking light that they will zoom in on. Until zoom in on that. <laughs> North America. America. <laughs> and the computer will be making these very obvious bleeping sounds. Yes. That's right. Precogs. Precogs will be determining where it's, it's happening. 105th Street. <laughs> sixth floor. Go. Yeah. Swarm Zero up. in on the triangulation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing I didn't under... Um, I don't know whether I just missed it, but why was he stalking her? Because she was the latest. Yeah, he's like a serial killer. He would lock onto a woman, drive him to suicide. Then that was literally when he discovered her was when he was looking out the window and saw her standing on the balcony. So it's just like by chance? Yeah, he was in New York first because he was on vacation or something. That I well, no, what it is is that apartment that he was in was a guy who was on vacation. I mean, yeah, he does this during the weeks where he's he has his time off. I actually really like that entire angle. If he's the maintenance guy who has access to all the buildings. Mm -hmm. What he was doing was he was using someone else's apartment while that guy was out of town. That rich guy whose apartment that she broke into? Yeah, the penthouse. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So who was the person who was harassing her in New York then? That was the same guy. He was in New York because he goes to different buildings. They mentioned that at one point. Well, no, this but is all in L.A. to Los Angeles. This was all in L.A.? Well, I thought he was uh, the one person who was in New York. Oh, because she no, just no. moved to L.A. from New York. That's what no, they that person in the opening segment was someone else that he was harassing. That was one of the women who committed suicide. Okay. Now, did she actually commit suicide or did he yes. throw her over the building? Okay. Wow. No, yeah, it cuts to that last call that they have to like a newspaper report of someone committed suicide. Okay, yeah. I missed that, okay. But uh, Lauren Hutton said that someone had been sending her dirty pictures in New York. Well, I think that was more just, you know, guys are dicks. Yeah, this movie should have been called Guys Are Dicks. <laughs> she's a pretty woman in a position of power. I'm sure harassment is something she's come up against numerous times. It's just never quite to this extreme. Yeah, I guess I was confused. I thought that the opening scene with the phone call was her being harassed by this guy and she moved to Los Angeles to get away from him. No, that was a different woman. Okay. That's just what I thought. That was one of the past victims who committed suicide. Oh, yeah. She was leaving a boyfriend, though, wasn't she? She said something about, like, getting away from it mm -hmm. and then... That's why Sophie said that I was also in the same position that said it was a she. Yeah, I just yeah. thought it was like a clever way of saying that she had this guy who was in her life who was essentially stalking her. And mm. she's just like, you know, man problems because <laughs> she didn't want to talk about it. Right. Okay. And then Sophie was actually still in that relationship. But one of the reasons why Sophie wanted to move was to get away from that. Oh, it's all coming together. It's again, it's John Carpenter really knows how to give you all these rich details without actually filling in all the blanks. I thought it was a nice little bit of setup in the beginning, just a little bit of like the phone call. And then I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I think that's enough information. Let's go. Let's see what the next. Yeah. Because it's always like I keep saying since the beginning, it's always more like an incident than it feels like story setup. Like it's just happening. And then even with everything that the guy's doing to her, she doesn't even put together the pieces right away that she's being stalked. I mean, she doesn't realize what the voices on the phone mean. She doesn't realize what the blinking of her lights means. She doesn't realize that all these gifts are coming from the same person. She still thinks it's part of that promotional program. It totally stopped being part of the promotional program when some guy calls you up and says, did you get your present? Yeah, I don't think a company would do that. <laughs> Like Columbia House, do you like your CDs? <laughs> no, I know, but it's like all these pieces are falling out. And I think that's intentionally on his part is he wanted to mess with her mm -hmm. and then have her realize what's going on and then really push it even further. Yeah, it's great for the audience, though, the slow burn, because you get that uneasiness and then it just builds, 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 builds until almost implausibility, but a great payoff in the end. <laughs> I mean, I love that moment where she comes home. And finds her door open. And this is even before all this has started. And while she's on the phone, you just see the guy run out of her apartment behind her. That was legit terrifying. Home invasion stuff gets to me. 
and then the pan down to the microphone that he's planted under the table. Absolutely. Yeah, that was scary. A lot of this is like pre-Scream Scream. Like Scream must have stolen a little bit from this, like with the harassing calls and everything. And it's really well done. And as I said, this is based on something that actually happened in the real world. I mean, the fact that it was a maintenance guy who has access to all these buildings, that was something that John Carpenter added. But a lot of this mm-hmm. is a dramatization of actual uh, stalking cases that were in the news at the time. Creepy. Kind of like fictionalized in a law and order type way. Mm-hmm. But still, this is stuff that people do and did at the time. Oh, wow. I like that it was explained. Mm -hmm. You know, like it wasn't just some crazy guy who somehow got access. Like Mm -hmm. they said they had all the facts, you know, like this is the guy, like he has access. This is a pattern of him doing it. And these deaths line up. Like everything was there. Yeah. And they figured it out themselves, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And then I love how he sends her a telescope knowing that later on he would use that to pin it all on another guy. Mm -hmm. And then what I love is that other guy, when they bring him in, he was saying, I just set up the telescope. So I was like thinking, did the stalker send him a telescope too? Yeah, might have. Just to do this? Yeah. He seemed to be very much in control. Like, that's why I say a little implausible at certain points. When it gets into sending Sophie on her flight, I'm just like, whoa, this guy's really organized. It's just interesting of like in his voyeurism of her, he's inviting her to participate in voyeurism herself in order to find him. Mm -hmm. Also, the other guy with the telescope was totally Uncle Leo from Seinfeld, I'm pretty sure. I believe so. Yeah, he was a character actor for a long time. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) And I love how you have that entire dramatic sequence with him in the basement where she's hiding under the grate in the laundry room. Mm -hmm. And it's literally just because he likes to sneak into this building because they have better washers. (laughs) Hey, it makes sense. That wasn't supposed to be like the laundry room for the building, was it? I think so. That was for her building, yeah. That's yeah. ridiculous. That's scary, yeah. Well, they have a brand new sky high. She's on the 43rd floor. There was like three dirty machines, <laughs> a blinking light, yeah. you know, through a parking garage? No, sir. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a parking garage under the road that actually is a parking garage for both buildings, this one and the one across the street. And then there was that entire row of storage lockers that she had to go past to get to the laundry room. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, most buildings will have like a laundry room on each floor these days. Oh, yeah. But back or then... Or at the very least, more than three machines for mm-hmm. at least 50... Do we need to say there's 2,000 apartments? Yeah. Yeah, but I think back then, it, you just have to create an industrial laundromat in the basement. Mm-hmm. I think so. Because of the way that you needed to ventilate it and at the time, the electricity that it used. I think that they've since made it so that you, you have better plumbing techniques and stuff. And maybe some paint and lights that work. (laughs) So it's less terrifying. (laughs) But I love then that this is a building with computer technology that will change the air conditioner based on where the sun is. Exactly. Yeah, they get you to buy before they show you the uh, (laughs) laundry room. (laughs) And this is where you'll be murdered. Yeah. (laughs) What I like about this film is it sets up a lot of stuff. And then instead of like, you know, dropping the ball and not following it, it's just kind of, you think this is where the story is going to go, but it doesn't. Like when Lee is in the beginning scene talking about how she's a big joker, I'm thinking, does this mean we're going to kind of a boy who cried wolf type storyline coming up Mm. but it doesn't and then you have the whole thing of him talking about all the advanced technology in the building i'm like is this going to come into play but it doesn't no it's a very 70s setup i find a lot of the 70s movies i've seen starts like that it's all like a towering inferno kind of setup where it's just like here's where we are this is what's happening this is how everything works and movie I don't know. I thought it was a setup, but the fact that everything was computer monitored, that made me believe that someone was messing with it. They had the yeah. ability to mess with her lights and dim them and all that stuff. Otherwise, it would be impractical yeah. that someone would be able to come into just your wiring and figure how, that out. How did you hack back then, though? <laughs> like, with computers were pretty simple. I think with, like, a wrench and a flashlight. You just literally plugged into the computer. Yeah. And uh, with a flashlight. A notepad. Because they didn't have networks <laughs> back then. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You couldn't really get into this. You put the yet. green wire with the green wire. But he was the guy who could. He was the guy who had the access that's true and uh, skeleton keys for everything that's too much power for some guy i don't know what the laws are currently in california but here the inspectors have to come to each building and go in with the maintenance person who has the keys for that building exactly yeah they couldn't just have one guy has the keys to all the buildings jimmy he just kind of floats around from town to town we don't really know where he lives and uh, he comes into your apartment whenever he wants it's cool you have to remember that the sky rise apartment complexes were still kind of a new thing at the time were they? I don't know. Yeah, they talk about it, how she is choosing, like, a lifestyle, that she's, like, living in this brand. Like, she says, take me to the, what is it, the Aztec building, what is it called? Arkham. The Arkham, oh, of course. Take me to the Arkham building. And, like, Abby just knows what that is. And when she says that that's where she lives, Sophie's like, oh, nice. It's like the Nakatomi I mean, Plaza. <laughs> especially to have one skyscraper facing another skyscraper. That was just kind of a new thing. As these cities started popping up in the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. 
So, I mean, it's stuff that we're used to nowadays, but back then it was still kind of different. And you didn't really know what all these complications were that would arise from it. Like murder? Like if, you, if you're right across from another sky rays, mm -hmm. everyone there can look right into you. Like she doesn't even close her windows when she's just walking around naked. Yeah, that's true. There's a big trend since like every time there's some sort of progress or new technology or a new way of living, there's always a movie that comes out right after that shows how scary that is. Well, I guess that means that thanks to Transcendence, we're all about to be able to upload our brains into the internet. I would imagine so. <laughs> I don't want to live on the internet. <laughs> Not at all? No. Yeah? Well, upload your brain to the internet. How about a holodeck? No. I well, will, but I'd rather wait until I'm done with this body first. Yeah, maybe right when I'm at the end, and then I'll just be like, okay, I'll go on a fantasy adventure. Come on a fantasy adventure with me, Julia. Come I'm on. interested in your holodeck scenario, yeah. but uploading my brain to the internet sounds terrible. Yeah. Have you seen the bottom half of the internet? I don't want to hang out with those people. <laughs> it's just going to be com yeah, comments <laughs> bombarding you all the time. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it's one of those things where it would, like, it would have its pros and its habits. But yeah, it's every time we have an emerging technology, you see more stories exploring the horrors of it. Absolutely. We have a lot of movies out there about how surveillance technology, you know, it destroys all privacy, it, all this stuff. The conversation. But you don't have stuff like, um, like remember when the, the London bombers struck those buses and trains about a decade back. The fact that they had surveillance technology on all cameras meant they could instantly go and find out who it was, trace their routes back to where their hotels were, trace those routes back. I mean, the thing about surveillance technology is nobody's actually watching you through the cameras. The cameras are just there to record for posterity so that if something happens, they can go back and look. Yeah, they review it based on the time. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Whereas it's different here because this is more Big Brother placing technology in the household to spy mm. on you personally. Yeah, well, it's a creepo, not a government agency. And it's about how with this technology becoming available, what's the worst case scenario? Yeah, exactly. And I can understand that because it's cautionary. It gets people to think about it, to try to work the kinks out of it. I mean, if it's just a damnation of saying, no, we will never do this ever, like pretty much all cloning movies are, you know, they come back without a soul and everything goes horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have a multiplicity where it's fun. Yeah, for sure. Or like the net where you can order a pizza online. That's great, but you might also get wrapped up in a conspiracy. So anyways, we're straying off topic. So someone's watching me. Mm -hmm. It's just so rich and, and compelling. It, it just pulled me in. It kept me interested and invested. Oh, for sure. I never quite knew where it was going to go. And as I said, even the second time I watched it here, I got caught up in finding all these other little details, all these other little buried threads and things. And it's such a well-crafted and constructed script that mm -hmm. based on some of the films that we've covered here... There's no denying that Carpenter was a talent, even just setting aside as a filmmaker. He was one hell of a writer. Absolutely. Such natural, funny, charming dialogue. Is, is Darren Carpenter dead? No. No, no. Oh. he's not. He's alive. He just because well. he said was. Oh, sorry. <laughs> not you. Noel did. Oh. <laughs> so I thought he was dead. Well, he's made two films in the last 15 years. Yeah. No one will pay him to make movies anymore. He's very old, too. Like, he's in his, like, 70s, isn't he? Yeah, so I mean, his career has kind of wound down, sadly. Mm -hmm. Not entirely due to him, it's just the studios left him behind. Oh. It's really sad. It's, <laughs> it's really, really sad. Out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as we'll see when we get into like the 2000s and stuff, we'll suddenly have like four episodes spanning like 15 years. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, one thing that this movie really makes me even more curious about is what his original draft of Eyes of Laura Mars was like. Because mm. there's so many elements here that are so similar to Eyes of Laura Mars, but presented in sometimes very different ways. I mean, like, especially the character of Lee is very different from the character of Laura, mm. who, as we talked about, was kind of an inactive character. And Lee, despite the fact that things are being done to her, still very much maintains control of the situation and tries to push against it. Mm -hmm. I can't even say that this was a response because this came out in the same year, so Carpenter probably hadn't even seen that movie yet when this came out. So I can't say that, like, this is his response, or this is what he wanted Isa Laura Mars to be, because I doubt it. Mm -hmm. But it makes me curious even more what his original draft is like versus the heavily rewritten one that we saw. I'm sure she was a more proactive character, which maybe that's why they felt like a thriller would be more successful with a reactive character, not realizing that in this movie, you can be proactive and it just gives the script momentum rather than like just meandering. It makes the character more interesting. Like, I mean, like the bit there where, you know, all this has been going on. He says, meet me in the parking lot. 
her first instinct, grab a knife, go down and get the bastard. Mm -hmm. And then like, even when she sees him in the window, her next instinct is grab a knife, go get the bastard. Oh yeah. Well, she is on no sleep. Her nerves are frayed. He's backed her into a corner and it's fight or flight and she's choosing fight. I mean, I love that moment where she goes and grabs the kitchen knife and runs her finger along it Mm -hmm. and cut to Sophie is just like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. (laughs) And she's just like, stay here, I'm going to go murder this guy. Uh, I believe she has the greatest line of all time. This is the edge I need or something like that. (laughs) We need an edge. This is the only edge I need. (laughs) Yeah, she's pretty awesome. I mean, like, could be such a cheesy line, but it was delivered so perfectly. Oh, her one-liners are incredible. They're like Harrison Ford level. (laughs) Yeah, and again, I'm not completely knocking Eyes of Laura Mars, which we all enjoyed. Oh, for sure. But this one is 10 times better than Eyes of Laura Mars. This one is just, it's so much tighter and richer. It doesn't have any of the problems of Eyes of Laura. Eyes of Laura Mars is still mostly a really good movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. Do they make made for TV movies like this anymore? Not like this, I would imagine. I mean, I know they make a lot of Hallmark stuff, things about Christmas, puppies. There's tons of thrillers on Lifetime and Hallmark, but this is what they should aspire to be. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the thrillers are usually like I Married a Maniac or something like that. Or like, like the Tammy yeah. Hogue novels and stuff like that. Of the dark psychological romance thriller. It's kind of like Twilight, but without the vampires. Oh, wow. That doesn't sound appealing at all. You know, the dark brooding boyfriend. Is he a killer or is he the man I love? Or is he both? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I worked on two Hallmark movies. And one was like a stalking type thing. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't anything like this. Like yeah. it was very formulaic mm-hmm. and... um And the other one was a Hallmark type of movie where it's like, can we find love again in our 40s? (laughs) And it had that guy from Married with Children in it. Darcy? Yeah, Darcy's husband. Okay. (laughs) He's very nice, by the way. Nice. (laughs) A little bit of a flirt. (laughs) The majority of them, and even the majority of TV movies in the 70s and 80s were very formulaic. They're made by people who couldn't break into the film industry, so they're just kind of regurgitating things. This was a standout even at the time it came out. This would have been one of those TV movies that most people probably wouldn't have even paid attention to it coming out, but those who saw it would have been like, whoa, wait, this is something. This is new. It's fresh. (laughs) Because, I mean, it's even just so, the way the shots are constructed in the scene, it's just so tight, so polished, which is surprising given that Carpenter was basically just handed a crew, a typical TV crew that he had never worked with before. He had no control over the editing, and yet they still edited it perfectly. He had no control over the score, yet they still scored it perfectly. Well, Psycho was made with a TV crew. Yeah, but that was still Hitchcock, still a complete creative control. Yeah, that's true. I think part of it is that Carpenter was excited to work with these guys, so he kind of brought out the best in them. Mm Mm-hmm, for sure. And he was still an eager young guy, just four years out of USC. He's like, hey, I get to work with these pros who have been in the business for a long time instead of my fellow crew members who are still figuring things out. So I'm going to take every opportunity I can to learn from them. And he still made a damn good film along the way. Mm -hmm. I would say this is probably one of Carpenter's strongest movies from my memory. And as I said, I'm going to be curious to see if by the time we finish this entire project, this might still be in my top five Carpenter movies. We shall see. We got a lot of good films coming out. So got a couple that I would pull above it, but Alex, you're probably not going to go with me on this. Hmm. I like this more than I do Halloween. I'll go with you on that. I actually (laughs) might go with you on that, too. I know it's controversial. I mean, Halloween is still so much more iconic. Yeah. But I mean, you know, Halloween, we, we, I'm actually kind of interested in letting you guys, I'm still editing that episode. I know it'll be out here in the day or two after we record this. But we really picked that movie apart, and it made me realize there was a lot of stuff in there to pick apart. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yes! <laughs> the Julia effect. I still love the movie, though. I do, too. It's okay to pick apart the stuff you love. It's hard to do, but it, there's nothing wrong with that. But I was thinking along those same lines where I was kind of get this creeping embarrassment where I'm like, well, this is a much, much better character to follow than Laurie Strode. And then I'm just like, I think I kind of like this movie better. (laughs) Like, it's very, like, I keep saying Hitchcockian, but it is very Hitchcockian, but very Carpenter at the same time, because Hitchcock had great dialogue, but this dialogue was more to my taste. (laughs) Like, it had jokes that I would find funnier and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, Hitchcock would take all those kind of little open threads that you don't need to explore and expand on them a little too much. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you know, the birds, you have this entire backstory of she was in Italy and was dancing in the fountain. Yeah. And it's like all this rich pouring out a novel's worth of backstory. And by halfway through the film, the birds have invaded and none of it means anything. (laughs) This one, you get just little details of, you know, she had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. She's dealt with stalkers. It tells you all you need to know in just one or two lines. 
Yeah, it's very tight and lean. It's my kind of thing. By the end of this project, I think John Carpenter is going to be my favorite director of all time. <laughs> it's going to be interesting because I can't think of any other films he did after this that are like this. Most of his films are going to be more along the lines of Halloween, a little wilder, a little, mm -hmm. you know, going off in some kind of crazier directions, you know, having that style of visualization, that style of music. This one, I mean, it was a much more kind of classical score, mm -hmm. more of your traditional kind of almost Jerry Goldsmith typey score, as opposed to his very, you know, rhythmic pulsating scores. Yeah. And that is John Carpenter. I, I don't want to take that away from him. This mm -hmm. was kind of him stepping into doing a more traditional film. But it's nice to see that. It's the versatility yeah. on display is great. And he shows he can make one hell of a traditional film. Absolutely. But I mean, I don't want to entirely take that away from him by saying that I wish he had done more like this than what we'll be seeing coming up, because he really goes off in some really neat directions. Yeah. You know, actually, one of the other ones I'm thinking of is probably Starman, which we'll get to, which is more of a traditional studio film. And I haven't seen it, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. Starman was the movie that Bill Murray said in the Ghostbusters. In Ghostbusters 2, yeah. He talks about Starman and something else. Yeah, because I, I, we watched Ghostbusters the other day, and I'm like, what's Starman? And I'm like, we're going to be covering that. <laughs> Watch out. I haven't seen it in a while myself, so it'll be nice to revisit and then hear what you guys think of it. Mm -hmm. I know that was also him stepping into more of a studio-controlled situation, and that one did so well that it was one of those few films to have an Oscar nomination tied to it. But it is interesting showing that he could be a studio director, but for the majority of his career, he wanted to be his own filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to, by saying that I kind of like this better than Halloween, at least in terms of like even just technical style, in terms of the cleanliness of the storytelling, I don't want to feel like I'm throwing Halloween under the bus because that still does a lot of interesting, innovative things in place of those other better things. Well, if we're doing a retrospective of a man's career, like comparing and contrasting is inevitable. So yeah. we're going to hold it against, at this point, his most successful film. Oh, yeah. I don't mind comparing yeah. and contrasting. I just don't want to say that I wish you had made more conventional movies. You know what? This is so good. Halloween sucks now. Because <laughs> the fact that his films are so unconventional is actually what made him kind of legendary. Of course, absolutely. But it's nice to see that he can do all these things. Oh, like, yeah. You can admire him on a different level. It's like being with someone and just opening your eyes and saying, wow, I'm seeing you in a whole new light, John Carpenter. <laughs> yeah. When we go on through the other movies, I'm very, very proud of his female characters. Mm. And um, I really, really, really liked the lead character in the Assault on Precinct 13. Uh, but I think Lauren Hutton really might have beat her out. Mm -hmm. Just because I got to know her so much better, too. Yeah. But she's so boss. Yeah. Like that scene where she's like smoking, drinking a glass of wine, fixing a walkie-talkie. Yep. Just hanging out at <laughs> her house. <laughs> Fielding phone calls from guys she's not going to date. Yep. Shutting that <laughs> shit down. <laughs> the conversation that she has with Sophie, where Sophie's like, you know, oh, you haven't slept. Uh, mm. You look all haggard. Uh, uh, what can I do? Can I do anything? And she just turns to her and is like, what can you do that I can't? <laughs> yeah. What can you do that I haven't done already? That's a great line, yeah. <laughs> that a car explodes in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, is that something like, obviously it's the same woman, like it's, yeah. it's a different variation of that woman, but he's writing the same type of woman. Does that continue through the rest of his movies? Um, uh, I think they're all replaced by Kurt Russell. <laughs> <laughs> his films do take more of a masculine bent. Especially once he starts with Kurt Russell. I mean, there are some, there are exceptions to that. And that doesn't mean that the female characters, I, I mean, he will have more female characters like Lee in Assault on Precinct 13, mm -hmm. where it's more of a supporting role, but it's still a strong role. The Fog has a few lead female, I mean, Adrienne Barbeau, yeah, she's who plays great, Sophie. She's one of the main leads in The Fog. So, I mean, he does have other characters like this, but they aren't mainly the focus of his types of movies. I mean, like, it'll be interesting. I'm still very curious to see The Ward which I know is about a young woman who's locked up in a woman's mental institution and just how the characters are and stuff there. But I know that was a script that he didn't write and he didn't have creative control over it. He just took it because that's the only job he could get. So it'll be interesting to see how like that contrasts with what we have here. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's going to be a very, very, very sharp contrast. Yeah. The most sharp contrast is probably the thing, which is a sausage party. I don't think there's a single woman in that Oh, movie. Starman. Starman has the lead character is female, and it's her dealing with an alien who's taken on the form of her dead husband. I remember her being a very strong female role. So, I mean, he does have other films where there are very strong female roles, and some of which where they are the lead. Mm -hmm. He's going to have a lot of kind of macho guy action movies. I think Assault on Precinct 13 is probably a closer indicator of the types of movies we're going to be seeing. I would agree with that. More than this. 
So, I mean, if you, if you want a stylistic comparison, Assault on Precinct 13 is more of what you're going to get. Going forward, though, I think we should remember these Lee years and see how they compare, like, with the later period as well, how his female characters hold up. Oh, yeah, especially when we get to, like, Starman and the Ward. I'm going to be very curious to compare them against this film. I may even dig it out and watch it again. Mm. Because this is a film that I have watched twice here in the last week, and I I, I want to watch it again. (laughs) That's great. I have a big problem where I keep watching these movies and then adding them to my Amazon wish list, so we'll see how it goes. (laughs) I mean, the first sign of a good film is that you'll want to watch it again right when you're done with it. For sure. The second sign of a good film is that you enjoy it just as much the second time as you did the first. Mm-hmm. Third sign is after the second time you watch it, you want to watch it again. <laughs> so, I mean, this fits all that criteria for me. Absolutely. It was really dependent for me on one thing. I'm just like, once it started getting into the part where the police are really not listening to her despite the mounting evidence, and they kind of have to take matters into their own hands, I'm like, the payoff is now paramount, where it's going to make or break this film. Like, I'm going to love everything that came before it, but if this goes out on a weak note, it's just going to fall like a deck of cards. And that's why I really appreciate the movie because the ending was exactly what I wanted it to be where the guy who had all the power loses the power Mm -hmm. she comes out on top and it's exactly what I wanted and it goes out on an amazing line at the end as well (laughs) the climax just does so many things right for me I mean what I love about the character of Paul and Paul is just such an adorable guy I love him what I love is that he's never there to save her Nope. He's there to help her and to support her, but he's still letting her be the leading force in the story. He's the one he'll throw ideas out and then she'll explore those ideas with him. Like, I know a cop. Can you come talk to him? She's the one who goes talk to the cop. I know the guy in the city department. Why don't we just head down to the city department? And I love that revelation of he's the guy who inspects the buildings and even just that great line of even the elevators. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He can get into those all the time. It's just this great casual conversation revealing just how much this one guy has been given that he has control of. Mm -hmm. And then all they have to do is just go over to a filing cabinet, they get his home address, and she bursts right into his house. Yep. I love that how she's carrying a rock, but she still kicks in the window. (laughs) And then I love that entire climax of she shows up at his home, finds all the evidence, and instead of having the confrontation there... I love the fact that the guy who walks up behind her is just the cabbie going, oh, lady, you're going to still need me for a ride. That was pretty creepy, yeah. And then the big final confrontation is he just wants to drive these women to kill themselves. She ends up leading him to jump out the window. Yep. His only power is distance. And as she says in the end, you got too close. Yeah, exactly. And even when he's finally in the apartment with her, He's still hidden in the shadows because he's just too much of a coward. Yeah, he is. And he only comes out of of desperation as she starts breaking the windows and shouting murderer. Yeah, she wasn't going to play that game. I just love how well constructed. I mean, this every scene is so perfectly constructed and they all build into a perfectly constructed story. Like, I even just love the scene where she's at the bar with Sophie and then the waitress comes up with a bottle and she looks over to the bar and there's no one there. The second time I watched it, I kept an eye. The guy is sitting there at the bar watching her. Oh, is he? Yeah. I was wondering if we had seen him before. I'm like, were we supposed to see him? Because I didn't recognize him at the end. He's in the background, so he's kind of blurry. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, yeah, you never see what his face looks like until the very end. So that's why when they get the fake guy, you think, could it be him? And they only show enough of the face to be like, well, it could maybe be him. It might not. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Then, like, you have the drunk guy who stops by the side of her car that one time. Yeah, for sure. At the beginning, I was getting flashes of Eyes of Laura Marge, and I'm like, if it's Paul, I am throwing this movie at the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's just, the thing is, it's kind of like Halloween in that in some way there could be suspects, but in another way, it's basically told you who the guy is from the beginning, that it's this specific guy. Mm-hmm. And then it sets about removing all the list of suspects, like someone is in the apartment, then you see the guy watching them. Like she's in the apartment with Paul, and then you see the guy watching her in the apartment with Paul. So it's like, okay, it can't be him. Mm -hmm. But it it like sets up these suspects and then systematically eliminates them as suspects. All the red herrings are essentially just dicks. (laughs) And then the big revelation isn't that it's a guy from her life. It's that it's this guy who's been given the keys to the city. Mm -hmm. The literal keys to the city. He has all access and all control without any regulation. And I love how then that's a big cautionary thing. And then this was probably a time when these were all things that were being talked about in the news. I think she's got a lawsuit on her hands against that company he works for. Yeah, it's just, I was really kind of quite blown away with this movie. Yeah, it was a really nice surprise. 
I mean, it's no uh, Zuma Beach, but... <laughs> now, if only it had been Lee showing up on Zuma Beach. She would have got things done a lot quicker. Four guys start following her out of the changing room. She's going to grab that knife and head right over. It's true. <laughs> you and you pair up. We're going to win this volleyball game. Let's make some hot dogs. Let's get out of here. Zuma Beach. Ten minutes. <laughs> She's not going to take a second conversation with the creepy guy. Nope. Creepy guy in his dirty pool. Yeah. So any final thoughts we have on someone's watching me? Julia? I don't know, man. Like, I'm kind of bummed now. Who are you bummed? Well, I guess I'm just kind of like mourning the loss of her. I feel like this character, the person that she is, how strong she is, smart, independent. If this had continued, if John Carpenter had made movies that have these kind of women in it, mm -hmm. you'd have changed history. For sure, I believe you. That's why I'm going to be very curious to hear what you think about Starman. Because from my memory, that is a very similar character. Yeah. Because this was, I have to say, gender flipped because it's exactly like what a regular movie you're used to. But it shouldn't be gender flipped. It should be the norm. Where sometimes it's a girl. Sometimes it's a guy. Well, I think what it is, is that it's a film about a female who's being victimized. But it subverts the victimization by making her a strong character who not only doesn't fold to the victimization, but is like, you shouldn't even be putting me in this position to begin with, you asshole. Mm -hmm. You know, and then that they have all this other commentary of showing the other ways that just society casually hits her with sexism mm -hmm. at the bar, at work, you know, with the manager, you know, just the casual sexism that people have to deal with in their everyday life. And mm -hmm. if she's not going to back down from that, she'll be damned if she's going to back down from getting it in its most extreme form. She will stand up to it and will fight back. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, I don't want to say, it doesn't gender flip her in a way that it's like she's macho, like she's essentially a man's role. Definitely not. No, she's no, been no, made no. a woman. She is a woman exploring women's issues in a very strong and positive image of a woman standing up to those views. Absolutely. No, I wasn't meaning to say that she's just like a man character now. Oh, no, yeah, I'm no, just no, saying I this, mean. this think, should yeah. totally be the norm. Tell me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. she's been given the opportunity that a male character would have. Perfect. That sums it up better than I could say it. Yeah. Right. And that opportunity in this film, if it had continued, mm -hmm. could have created an entirely new history of cinema and given me someone to look up to a lot sooner than I had. Absolutely. I'm learning a lot, man. Like, <laughs> seeing this through Julia's eyes has been wonderful. <laughs> and, and this is, again, why I would just be very curious to see what his eyes of Laura Mars was like, because there it was, everything was happening to her, and she was just despondent about it. There was nothing she could do, so she didn't do anything. And it was always about the guys coming to her rescue, but the guys are also the ones who are attacking her. And it just, it never quite could figure out where it wanted to go. Mm -hmm. This one, it has a very clear definition of this is a character who is not going to put up with shit. But then it's also, you know, she's a strong character, but she's not a tough jackass. No. She's funny. She's bright. You know, she's still also someone that you really just want to go out and hang out with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's because she's an actual person. Yes. Yes. She's written as an actual person. A lot of times when you do see women doing air quotes, you can't see tough roles. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, what was that? Uh, Katie Sackhoff. What was that? Oh, movie? in a Riddick. Yeah. yeah. But that kind of idea of yeah. like a bustier and I'm polishing a gun and I don't take shit from nobody, yeah. but really I have no character. No. Exactly. Like there's nothing to me this is a person yeah exactly it was a person all the vulnerabilities make sense yeah, yeah. And it's also like lee in assault on precinct 13 it's like you know there she was a badass who like stood there with a gun and took out these people with one arm and yet she was also a very feminine woman she was funny it's showing that being a woman and being feminine doesn't mean that you're weak you can still be strong while being that Absolutely. But then it also shows that, you know, society, you should still not be giving this woman the shit that you do. No. But then she will still stand up to it. Yeah. That Steve should have been fired for even 30 seconds of everything he said or did to her. <laughs> well, that's a that's an HR write-up. Yeah. Steve should have been tasered in the balls. <laughs> yeah, that too. He should have also been kicked in the balls. But just like, why don't you go out with me? No. Okay, why don't you do it anyways? <laughs> but then he would probably be laying there on the ground saying, you're into that? That's cool. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, Steve. How did he get her number? <laughs> like, he should not have had her number. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think of that. But yeah, I mean, that he's the stalkery coworker who will get your phone number and call you at home and refuse to take no. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really too much of a message with him. He was kind of mostly there for the phone fake out and a little bit of red herring. But it was yeah. interesting to see that. But it was also just to do the overall theme of the sexism of society, you know? Yeah, to show how she responds to that. Yeah, for sure. 
to yeah. show how she would react to something like that. Yeah. And what's interesting is that there's still so much of this that you could apply in a modern day film. Oh, yeah. There's some differences in terms of what the police would be able to do and when they would get involved and all that stuff. But in terms of the way she's treated in her daily life, it's still kind of, you know, sadly the status quo. Oh, for sure. Actually, this film is way more progressive than most of the films that come out. This is a film that ages really well. Yeah, like this film could be out now and people would be like, wow, that's really progressive. <laughs> the only real difference is that you have to get up and go out to get your phone every time it rings. That's true, yeah. My only criticism, the only thing that never entirely made sense to me was that she never once just unplugged the phone, even just at night. However, I can understand that from the character of that would still be her giving in. Yeah, she didn't want to back down even from the lines of communication. And if she unplugged her phone, if he did intrude, that would also hamper her escape if like she had to call like a, the police or something. So I could see why she would want to keep that. What I love is that the whole thing is it's not treated as I'm not going to give in being her being stubborn. It's she's not giving in because she shouldn't have to. Yeah. She shouldn't have to just sit there and take it because this is something that shouldn't be done to her in the first place. And the police should have been way more involved. Like, where is she going to go? Like, he's calling her at work, too. He's clearly going to follow her to the next place. So there's really nowhere to run. I, mean, I even just love the moment where, you know, she gets in the car and is driving and then suddenly, oh, the walkie talkie is sitting on the seat next to her. Oh, by the way, here's your friend being killed by me again. Yeah. That, that was, was just so... hard. Yeah. <laughs> And they fully set that up of how he got a hold of both walkie-talkies. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, man, I love this movie. It's pretty awesome. This is another one of those movies that makes me so happy that we're doing this project. Yeah, for sure. My top five is definitely going to have this and Assault on Precinct 13 for sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, this is just all the films that I had never seen. By I mean, I'm not only getting to revisit my favorites and re-exploring them like I did with Halloween. But then I'm just seeing all these great little nuggets that I'd say the weakest one that we've done so far is Resurrection of Bronco Billy. And even that was still interesting. Mm -hmm. But as like a student film, it's still yeah. pretty good. Yeah. It still at least had that one scene that we all talked about where he's like with the woman in the park who drew his picture. Of course. Yeah. And then there was Zuma Beach. Zuma Beach was not a great movie, but it was still a really fun kind of charming movie. I had a blast with Zuma Beach. It was worth rediscovering. Mm hmm. Thank you guys for doing this with me. Aw. <laughs> I'm really enjoying uh, no it so far. Yeah, it's really great. It's been really eye-opening. I've been having a lot of fun. Well, we're finally reaching the milestone of leaving 1978. <laughs> it's been a long been year. been here for four films, yeah. Yeah. What is the next one? Uh, Elvis. Oh, yeah, that's Is that 79? Cool. Next one is going to be Elvis. That was 79, yeah. Is All it right. about Elvis? Yes, it's a miniseries biopic of Elvis Presley. Cool. Starring Kurt Russell, and it's the first film he did with Kurt Russell. All right. I'm excited. And this is a miniseries, you say, for television. Okay. Yeah, it was a two-part miniseries. And it'll be his final TV movie for a while. Uh, no, wait, there's there's going to be one other one after Elvis, but we'll, I'll get into that when we get into that. Because mm -hmm. that's one that we weren't planning to cover, but I finally found it. Very exciting. And this is written by or directed written by? by? It's going to be okay. written by. All right. But Elvis is just directed by, he didn't write Elvis. Okay. We'll get into the backstory when we get into that one. But yeah, that's going to be, and, and, and Julia actually, to get into the, in terms of what types of characters he follows in the films, one of the reasons why we see so many macho characters is because him and Kurt Russell struck up such a relationship that he did films for Kurt Russell to star in. So that's why we get so many more macho movies, because he had this one actor that he just wanted to keep working with. His muse. Yeah, and so he would build these movies to star this guy. Mm. So, but then again, that's only going to be like seven or eight movies, I want to say. So, I mean, we will have other things that are going to be interesting. And, but yeah, I think that it also speaks a lot that, you know, studios just don't green light films like this. No. A lot of slasher films have lead female protagonists, but they're usually in states of distress and peril. Yeah. And undress. And undress. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, she was in States of Undress here, too, but it was a TV movie. Oh, yeah. I got angry at that. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, are you in the shower for no reason? Great. Yeah. <laughs> Always in the shower. <laughs> I think parts of that were to just genuinely build the atmosphere of how much this guy's actually seeing without her being aware of it. And then there's that moment where she realizes he's been watching her. Oh, yeah, when she calls and he's just like, you look a lot better without your robe. Yeah, and then you have that kind of great Hitchcockian push-in where the background distorts. Mm. And I understand why they were kind of cavalier with her states of undress, because they were building to that moment where it hits her. 
that all the times that she was relaxed, she was being watched. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, because when she moved in and she wasn't wearing pants, she was just wearing a shirt and like Mm -hmm. emptying boxes and stuff. I'm like, that I was down with. Because you know what? If you cannot wear pants, don't. Yeah. (laughs) Why? Why? Why would you wear pants? (laughs) I think it was just the shower in particular, where for some reason, whenever there's a female in any movie, she's going to at some point get out of a shower. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I did appreciate that they were setting it up over time where she's relaxed in her own home, where Mm -hmm. pantsless or or what it may be, and that the whole time that someone would be watching you. I think they were also setting up the shower. Well, there were a few things. I mean, there was that one where she was interrupted in the shower when the package came. That's the part I'm talking about, yeah. He also was setting up the shower because it's that time when she comes home, finds the shower running. And that message has been written on the mirror. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was no one will believe you? No one believes you. No one you, believes yeah. you. No one yeah. believes you. This guy's a jerk. And it's like just such a constant state of barrage mm-hmm. that he is throwing at her. And that she still rises up and, and takes him on. Mm-hmm. I love this movie. <laughs> That's pretty great. Pretty great. I'm glad this movie's now out there for people to watch. Mm-hmm. I hope it gets a rep. Because this, this is one that should be watched. Carpenter fans should watch it. Fans of a good thriller, a good movie. I'm going to pass it on to a few people. I just love being suspended, yo. Yeah. I just love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that feeling of you stop thinking about everything else and you just wait in anticipation Mm -hmm. for whatever is going to happen. Yeah. (laughs) You're like, movie, do what you want. Yeah. And after Halloween, that we did last week, I can see why that didn't work as well for you. This one worked better for me than Halloween ever has, and I love Halloween. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You completely tore down Halloween for me. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Only to build you back up, honey. Only to build you back up. Better, stronger, faster. With a new love. <laughs> I'm still going to make you watch the sequels, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch them, but I'll have comments. <laughs> okay, we all will. Yeah, we will. Halloween is a very interesting franchise. <laughs> yes, definitely. So anyways, I think that wraps up Someone's Watching Me. I think yep, so. I think so, too. I think we'll title this one Someone's Listening to Us. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> a better name for this movie would have been Excursions Unlimited. Yes. <laughs> ooh, ooh. That would be, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as I said, the original title was High Rise. Right. It's kind of generic. Yeah. I could see why they changed the name because it's very much in that kind of 70s vein of he knows you're alone. Yeah. Well, I think they have an idea anyways that they called it that because it's a made for TV movie mm. and people looking through their TV guide were like, someone's watching me. Hmm. Sounds like a thriller. I like thrillers. I'll watch that. Yeah. <laughs> Where if it's called High Rise, people are like, what is that? A documentary? I'm not watching that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> see, and then that's also probably why Excursions Unlimited wouldn't work. Oh, yeah. No one would know what that would mean. Excursions <laughs> Unlimited make a boss feature film. Today. Yeah, for sure. But it's still just a nice title. Yeah. And then I love that he even has his own printing press that he's been printing the header on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guy's a like, huge nerd. <laughs> <laughs> he has his own like 17th century printing press in the corner. <laughs> He's got a way too many hobbies, this guy. I mean, I just even love that bit where she, like, has that moment where she breaks down, flips the... T- she literally flips the table. Yeah. And then just that slow turn of her head as she sees the little microphone laying next to her. Mm-hmm. And then, instead of that being the thing that finally crushes her after having broken down, that actually rejuvenates her, and she says, okay, now certain things suddenly make even more sense. Mm-hmm. I now have more drive to go out and continue to take action. It's like she's been pushed to her lowest point, and just when you think this would be the thing to tip her over the edge, it's like, that gives me a reason to keep fighting. Oh, the Lees we've come to know. They're so great. (laughs) Carpenter and his Lees, yeah. That's true. Well, maybe not Sheriff Lee Brackett, but... (laughs) Well, we have the two Lees. (laughs) He just kind of wandered around with Loomis. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) But yeah, no, yeah, between this and Assault on Precinct 13, he has... You could almost just pretend this is a sequel to Assault on Precinct 13. Oh, that would be amazing. Except she just shows up with, like, a fake arm. I would love to see an entire franchise, the Lee series. (laughs) Eight films. Man, this was a good movie. Yeah, for sure. Even now, like, even with something like Zuma Beach, Suzanne Somers still stays with me. Yeah. Like, sometimes I'll be, like, in the shower or I'll be making dinner or something like that. And just the idea of them making that sandcastle together Mm. will, for some reason, come in my mind. This Lee character... Is going to stay with me for sure. Mm -hmm. I think she's going to kind of be my friend. Yeah. And I'm going to think about her. And honestly, I'm inspired by her. That's great. I think it's everything that I would like to be. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be a badass. (laughs) (laughs) Sexy. (laughs) 
<laughs> Doing it for myself, woman. Yeah. This is what every protagonist should be. Yeah. They should be this complex of a person. Mm -hmm. They should stand up to the threat like this. And it makes the stakes higher. Like, I don't know if people seem to think, like, the damsel in distress kind of thing makes more vulnerable. But this, like, the stakes are higher because she's doing things I would do. Right. And it's real consequences. And what would happen? That puts me on the edge of my seat. I mean, that's the thing is with Laurie, we got to see a few moments of her doing things. It's just they waited until so late in the story yeah. to give her any room to really be proactive so that by the time we get there, she doesn't have much that she can do. Exactly. But Laurie also, I give a, uh, she's a kid. <laughs> like, she's just a babysitter kid. Right. You're like, I would be the exact same as Laurie in that situation. I wouldn't be as strong as Lee is in this right. film. <laughs> I mean, like, even in Assault on Precinct 13... All the shit goes down earlier in the story. Mm -hmm. So we have time to develop them through the scenario. Yeah, for sure. And I'll agree, Halloween takes a long time to get going. Yeah. I don't mind that because it fits the story and all that stuff, but it's in hindsight, sitting down and looking at it, I can see why that doesn't work for people and why mm -hmm. it might be too out there. Yeah. But yeah, Someone's Watching Me is one of those films where I'm just watching and I'm like, this is what movies should be. Mm -hmm. This is how you make a movie. <laughs> this is a good, damn well-made movie. For sure. We need to get John Carpenter to listen to our podcast, especially this episode. <laughs> <laughs> John. Well, I'm glad he's not dead. I... These are the things I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's anything. I don't know anything. <laughs> Except for uh, I did see what, the Snake Bliskin 2. Oh, Escape yeah. Escape from so, L.A., yeah. Escape I've seen LA. that a lot. Yeah. Just because I own the VHS just because Steve Buscemi was in it. Mm -hmm. But other than that, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the fact that I'm calling it Snake Bliskin 2 probably gives you a good indication. <laughs> indication of where you're coming of from. Where I'm coming from. <laughs> yeah, no, Julia, you, you have me kind of sad because we won't be getting more films like this, too. I know, it's actually... We're leaving a... It's, it's an end of an era, break. yeah. Halloween and, and Assault on Precinct 13 are the types of films we're going to be getting, but I want more like this. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get genre, like, grindhouse-type picks, but, uh, I mean, that's not a bad thing. Like, this is turning, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm starting to question whether, like, the character that Lauren Hutton is, like, say if... Let's say it was Lauren Hutton instead of Kurt Russell. Like, there's elements I even remember from Snake Bliskin 2, which mm. is, like, wisecracks with his proactivity, with mm. him being intelligent and independent and all of those type of things mm. that are parts of her. Mm. Whereas if his muse had been a woman, if it had been Lauren Hutton, mm. you're like, what could have happened with that? What if Adrian Barbeau was Snake Bliskin? Well, I mean, here's the thing is... We get a brief instance of that for a few years with Adrian Barbeau, and that's in fact The Fog was crafted around having a great role for Adrian Barbeau, but their marriage fell apart within a few years. Mm. So it's like if that had kept going, maybe you would have seen more films built around that. Okay. But no, it, it raises interesting kind of questions, just where could his career have gone? Mm -hmm. This and Halloween have actually been really enlightening episodes. It's been changing my views of the films that I take for granted and of John Carpenter's films specifically. I'm actually very delighted. <laughs> <laughs> and then even Zuma Beach and Eyes of Laura Mars, you get to see what Carpenter is like in the hands of someone else. You get to really kind of see what makes Carpenter Carpenter through what stands out mm -hmm. versus, you know, what other people have done with Carpenter. Mm -hmm. Zuma Beach, there were a lot of characters in there that felt like Carpenter characters characters. Yeah. That I'm only now because of these films realizing Carpenter has characters. He does. Well, I, I can't even believe that I mean I'm finding it hard to believe that we're going to get to a place where there isn't like he's creating like tapestries like these are real people that are relating to each mm. other that have real conversations that have depth and layers and like all of these things that it's going to slowly turn into Tentacle I have a monsters. gun yeah. and you don't and that's it. <laughs> well, and I think part of it is because he has the freedom of still being early in his career here whereas within just a couple of years I mean Halloween made him a horror icon so he got stuck with horror for a while. Mm. He didn't want to just make he wanted to make westerns. He wanted to make comedies. And he just got stuck in the horror genre for a while and then escaped from New York, which we're going to be getting to here in just a couple of years, or uh, well, a couple of years in terms of the timeline of his movies, kind of made him then an action director. Mm -hmm. And then he got stuck doing action movies for a while. So, I mean, it's like he has this massive success and the studio only wants him to just keep replicating that success. So, I mean, one of the big problems of Carpenter's career is that in only a handful of instances is he really making the movie he wants to make versus being given something by the studio and just doing whatever he can with it. 
Mm -hmm. Like even the thing, we'll be getting to the thing, that was something that was given to him and he just made the best that he could with it. It is interesting seeing this early part of his career, especially going through all the stuff he wrote, because most of those are original projects that he's just doing himself and then were passed on to other people. So, I mean, you got like Eyes of Laura Mars and Zuma Beach. And I mean, even uh, Someone's Watching Me was supposed to be one of those. He just wrote it. And it was only later that they were like, hey, you want to direct it too? Hmm. I mean, it's like if he puts this much effort into crafting a story that someone else is going to do. And I, I saw this also with Prey. Prey I had a few criticisms with, but Prey was a magnificently constructed screenplay with just amazing characters. I love that I got to read that script. It makes me long for this carpenter because we are not going to get this carpenter for the most part. I know. That is sad. It is sad. What a strange journey this has been. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're still so early in his career and we're already realizing we're not going to get the career that we wished we could. <laughs> and like, I'm even thinking about, you know, like, They Live is fun, but it's not this. No, it isn't. Prince of Darkness is fun, but it's not this. Big Trouble in Little China, it's fun. It's not this. It's true. So it's like, yeah, we got a long road to still go. A long road. And we're already realizing it's a slightly lesser road than we hoped it would be. Yeah, but we're going to make the best of it. Well, I know that, like, I'm picking out moments, right? But, like, say, Suzanne Summers building that sandcastle. Mm. Say, oh, um, the moment. conversation yeah. that she had with Sophie when they were going up in the elevator with the groceries. Mm. And mm -hmm. they were just flipping and having a conversation. Mm. Setting it up in the morning where she's like, if you watch someone in a movie talk to themselves, like, it's weird. Mm. And it seems like unorganized filmmaking. Mm. But the way that he had her talking to herself in the beginning about mm. getting ready to go to the interview, about doing a mock interview and talking to herself and setting all that up was really, really clear. Mm -hmm. And like all the little things that stay with you is like, I'm worried they're going to go away. <laughs> oh, well, we're going to have to because see. Because, you know, like what I said with Halloween, mm. where I'm like, I want to be in the backseat of that car with mm. Lori and her friend. Like those places is where I want to be. And I'm scared that we're going to get to a point where those people are gone. Yeah. No, and, and I, I see what you mean, because this is a very character driven story, even though it's the characters don't even meet each other for a while. Whereas Halloween and like Eyes of Laura Mars are more of a situation driven story. It's like we have characters and then these are the things that happen to the characters. How do they respond to it? Whereas this one, it's driven by the characters. Assault in Precinct 13 was driven by the characters. We're going to be seeing more like Halloween where it's more situation driven. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I'm kind of not. <laughs> I'm a little let down by that too. Yeah. But I am still hopeful because mm -hmm. I know that I know this feeling. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like we've connected. So when we watch movies in the future, I'm going to be looking for it. Yeah. You know, like I'm yeah. going to be looking for that spark. Mm -hmm. So if he is given a movie he didn't write, mm -hmm. that if he is given a genre that he didn't necessarily want to continue to do, that doesn't mean that that spark that's inside him dies. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. going to be seeking it out in everything for that sure. we do. Oh, me too. Yeah. I mean, because it's even like with Zuma Beach made me look at how he wrote the teen characters differently in Halloween. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and now I have this context for how he is as a writer that I'm going to apply that to his upcoming films. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm gonna, I agree with you there. I'm really going to be looking forward to finding those moments within his later films. There's hope. <laughs> there is hope. There's always hope. And we are going to have, as I said, this period of original scripts that he wrote all came from this period of time, from like 1975 to 77, 78. After that, he was kind of off making his own films. He didn't just write these scripts. But I mean, he churned out a lot of scripts in that short period of time. And those scripts, many of those scripts are still going to be produced over the course of the next 20 years of his career. Mm. So, I mean, we, we have some films coming up down the road that he wrote during this period of time. Can That's I call exciting. them Easter eggs? <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for that next Easter egg. <laughs> I am especially curious to see those. Yeah. I know some of them were rewritten, some of them weren't. I'm going to be very, very curious to watch those. Yeah, I'm excited to see them pop up. But no, thank you, Julia, between this and Halloween, you've made me see Carpenter in a lot of different lights. Oh, mm -hmm. that's really nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's one of my favorite filmmakers, and I didn't even realize just how awesome he was. Aww, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's awesome. So anyways, I think that I think we're done. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. All right. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back. We're going to be taking a month off after this episode. I'm moving and we're just going to have a busy time, but we'll be back with Elvis. Yep. We'll see you then. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. 
To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com.